Hey guys, hey Jill. How is it? Oh, good. Welcome to the show, guys. Welcome to another episode with uh, Jill Rowley. Did I uh, pronounce it well? You did, Romeo Man. Man, man, man. Man, <laughs> man, yes. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know everybody makes that mistake. It's more German, man. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we, we got that out this early. So, guys, we have the honor to have Jill. 23 years of experience in GTM, like a lot of um, expertise, a lot of knowledge there. I will just, I will try to make a, an intro, but I'm sure you will do much better. And I'm sorry if I don't make the best uh, kick-ass presentation out there, but I will just tell you names, guys. We are talking Salesforce, Elequa, HubSpot, Marketo, and a bunch of other advisory uh, companies. We are talking about different funds for GTM. So we are talking here with a legend when it comes to, to GTM. And because I'm a major of history, I want to go back in the history, right? <laughs> and talk about GTM because at the end of the day, um, there are some basics that even today uh, we need to do well so that we can do the fancy bancy ABM and RevOps. Am I right, Jill? Yes, Romeo, you are, you are so right. And uh, I, I do think history informs where we're going and it's the pattern matching, um, connecting the dots that helps us see around corners. Uh, and it's that experience, right? Of, of being part of the movie, right? Of, of not just watching the movie, but being part of the movie. Yeah. So before we dive into it, let's do a small like uh, agenda. Like what's what's your top of mind today and what we will talk about in, in this episode before we go to the history, just to, to give a, a, a glimpse to the people. Sure. So top of mind today, um, if, if we think about go to market, when I started in software 23 years ago, uh, go-to-market was sales. And your salespeople mm. were your go-to-market, right? You built a product, you had salespeople, they sold the product. That was go-to-market. Then through the work that I did in um, marketing automation and MarTech and marketing operations, I joined Eloqua in 2002. Uh, marketing automation really wasn't uh, a, a, a tool yet for B2B marketers. Email was pretty new for B2B marketers at that point in time. Um, the marketing really moving from top of funnel leads, go to a trade show, scan badges and toss them over. That's really what marketing was. And the maturation of marketing over the past 20 plus years now marketing actually has influence on what I call unaware. Buyers are unaware that they have a problem, unaware that there's a solution, unaware that you can solve it. Marketing helps buyers become aware and marketing is all the way through to advocacy, right? Customer advocacy, mm -hmm. customer marketing, customer journey. So marketing now truly um, is, is, is influencing, I think, more of the buyer and customer journey than sales. And so mm -hmm. marketing has matured to need marketing operations, marketing technology. Um, and, and, and so that, that is the, the marketing and then CS, right? So we all realized, oh, wait, this is subscription and we have to renew the customers that we earn and we have to deliver recurring impact to the customers that we spend so much money to acquire, to win. And CS, customer success, customer service and support has become a part of understanding your revenue and, and your, your, your revenue growth. So get, let's get to go to market today. Many companies still aren't even at marketing sales mm -hmm. CS as the go to market. Many companies haven't got to the looking at the tech stack holistically of rev, rev tech. And many companies haven't been able to achieve rev ops, truly meaning 
marketing, sales, and CX. Let me then talk about what is so exciting to me real quickly, and then we can peel the layers back and, and then move forward again. Ooh. But today, I'm really focused on partnerships, partner ecosystem. And if you think about how many different pieces there are of a company's tech stack, right? There's 14,000 tools yeah, in the MarTech stack. Those have to work together. They not only mm -hmm. have to be integrated, they need to be orchestrated. And so mm -hmm. partnerships, right? How do, does your product work with other products that your buyer uses? You think about the buyer's ecosystem of technology first, and you say, what piece of the tech stack is my product and how does it fit into the rest of the tech stack, right? And you do more of the work as a software company to ensure that what you're taking to your customer is part of their holistic solution. How does it integrate? How do you orchestrate from a data, from a process workflow insights? And so this going to market with your partners, selling with, marketing with, delivering value to your customers with your partners, partnerships and partner ecosystem, that is a go-to-market motion that is becoming much more important um, as we see, again, the continued proliferation of of disparate software products. Yeah, I start to see more and more like software which helps you integrate. Let's say that you're a law firm and you have HubSpot and then you're an accounting firm, right? So the persona might be very similar, right? So what you do is that you share the data into this proxy, let's say, or middle type of software. Yes. Um, and then you say, okay, what are the deals that both you as a law firm you work on and what this same deal, or maybe you have a customer with the accounting firm. So then there is a partnership and you can share the data and start to um, actually work together. And I saw in e-commerce, in B2C, this is done a lot with even meta pixels, like simple as pixel, pixel, right? Okay. Because you are, a, let's say, an e-commerce selling shoes, and then you have an e-commerce selling socks. Why not combine them and then uh, do partnerships? So this is the type of, when, when you talk about partnership ops, um, th this is the type of topic we are talking about, or it's more around the technology behind it? Um, it's it's all of that. So when we think about ops, ops is data, it's systems, it's process, it's insights, and done well, um, RevOps helps set the strategy of of a company, mm -hmm. right? The strategy for um, acquiring customers, keeping customers, growing customers, and determining as a company also your product roadmap right? Your, your product roadmap, are you going to build new functionality? Are you going to acquire a company that fills a gap in your product offering? Or are you going to partner with a company that fills the gap of, of your product offering? So partner ops, I think it all starts actually with what everything should start with, which is the data. So like you mentioned, where is the overlap in the socks and the shoes company customers, right? What is, where mm. do they already share customers? Who, how many customers do they have that buy both the socks and the shoes from them? Yeah. That mm. software hasn't existed. And there's yeah. new software, a partner tech, right? A partner tech stack. You think MarTech, sales tech, mm. yes tech mm -hmm. stack. There's a new tech stack emerging and it's called partner tech. And when you have mm. a new tech stack, you need operations around that tech stack to actually collect and organize the data, to operationalize the data, to infuse the data into other systems, right? Your other revenue systems, your CRM system, your marketing automation system, your ABM systems, this data, this partner data, which historically has not, it's lived in spreadsheets. Right, you have two yeah, yeah, companies, yeah. 
the way that they understand and figure out who are their shared customers. And then who are not, it's, 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 it's right. Exactly. It would be for tables. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, so it's, this is, yes. So this is, this is the near bound that you were talking about on, on, on LinkedIn. This is what you coined like as a name naming for it. Yes. Nearbound is really a new category in terms of mm. the vision and and the and the and the concept. So nearbound is is broader than just partners and partnerships. Nearbound, the idea of nearbound is is really a surround strategy, and it plays on outbound. So let me talk about outbound. We know what that is. We target. Yeah. We interrupt, right? We're, we're, we're actually trying to steal someone's time. That's outbound. It's interruptive. <laughs> we're targeting. We're prospecting, right? We're doing the call, email, call, email, LinkedIn play. And the buyers do Google call. ignore, delete, ignore, delete, right? Do not accept, yeah. remove connection. So that's outbound. Inbound, HubSpot created the category. And inbound um, was a was a, a really a better way to attract, right? To pull in people leveraging content that would educate, inform, uh, and, and help that buyer. So now though, with the proliferation of everybody's doing outbound and inbound, everybody's creating tons of content. And with AI, there's gonna be even more content. The decreasing effectiveness of inbound okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to earn the attention of our buyers? We look at who do our buyers already trust? Who do they learn from? Who influences them? Who do they already work with? What products do they already use? So the idea is we want to be closest to the customer. We want to be nearest to the customer. The, the, the customer that we want and the customer that we have. And so what we say is who is already nearest to the customer? Who already surrounds the customer? And then we say, does it make sense for us to be near to them, right? Is there a joint value proposition? Is there a better together story? And so Nearbound is really about proximity to the customer. How do you get closer to the customer? And you can do that by being in market with your customers, by building partnerships with the companies that your partner, that your customers already work with. So this is more of the, the, the philosophy near bound and the technology that focuses on the partner aspect, the partnerships aspect, the partner data is reveal a B2B SaaS company and Crossbeam a B2B SaaS company solving the same problem for buyers. They're fiercely competitive. It reminds me of the Eloqua Marketo days. Very, very competitive, very similar in capabilities, except like Eloqua was more enterprise. When Marketo came on, they were more mid-market, like high, high small business, mid-market. So we were we were really serving a different segment, Eloqua and and Marketo, and with Crossbeam in Reveal, they're they're less differentiated at this point in time. Um, I would say Crossbeam is a bit more upmarket, um, and really the, the 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 differences of the two are are today more about the network, because partnerships is is a network, right? It's 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 not like HubSpot to one partner, like HubSpot to Sixth Sense, their partners, but HubSpot has a bunch of other partners. Sixth Sense has a bunch of other partners. And you're looking at the network effect of this partner ecosystem. That's what Crossbeam and Reveal help companies like manage. First, like be able to see the connections and then be able to say, what do we do with this data? How does that change our marketing campaigns? How does it change our ABM campaigns? How does it change our co-sell motion? How does it change the way our CS team operates? So yeah, it's a. I think I think in an ABM motion and 
talk here a lot about that. It's a no-brainer. Like, uh, I was using Reveal also, and I was introduced to Reveal at Saster um, a few years back. And when I entered and I said, oh, my God, this is amazing for ABM. Like, imagine how much... You, like you, you are doing a bunch of research. You're trying to reach out. You're trying to, to get to those uh, decision makers. And yet, maybe at Saster you have next by a SaaS company that already works with those guys, or they have, a, they, they, they can give you an intro, and then you can do it together, right? Or you do co-marketing, right? Like you create an event because you. You have a targeted account, the same company, I don't know, BMP Paribas or whatever big company if you're in, in, in banking. Uh, and then, oh, oh my God, like you can create an event in Paris. You can create for those personas. You can share the costs, so on and so forth. And nowadays, I suppose, you know better than, than I do that VC, uh, I, 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 VCs are looking at, how companies can optimize better go to market and this is one of the solutions you don't do the event alone anymore in paris when That's you exactly target right. beauty for you. yeah and but you let's can... go back to history yeah. a bit because i'm interested yeah. what is gtm in you know 20 years back and how is gtm today like what like are we doing the same things but just differently or uh, and what happened on the way? I'm really curious about your thoughts. On yeah, this. yeah. So when I think about GTM, I think first about the customer. So the what what the what we what we do as a company, what we do as a business, we have to solve customer problems. Like everything mm. we do is in pursuit of how we deliver value to our customer. What is the impact that we have on our customers' operations, business, revenue, efficiency? So we have to think first, really everything I, 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 I think through the mental model of the customer first, and what I want to do is I want to live in market with my customers. I want to show up where my customers are learning. I want to be part of the communities that my customers are in, right? So, so we think about how do we understand better the, the business challenges, the opportunities, the problems that our customers are trying to solve the way they're solving them today, and then how do we fit into their, their, their world? So from a go-to-market perspective, we have to think about from a marketing perspective, who is our ideal customer profile? We need to be very clear on our ICP, our ideal customer profile. And that could be any number of things. It could be size of company. That's a really like obvious one, right? Enterprise, mid-market, SMB. It could be um, uh, uh, the industry that they're in, healthcare, life sciences, uh, retail, right? So we could think about it. Is our product something that is better suited for a specific industry? It could be geography. Right. So if we're in Paris, do we want to focus on EMEA and work with companies in EMEA? Or do we want to, I, I, Eloqua was a Canadian based company, but we, we didn't spend our time selling into companies in Canada because the companies that would be beneficial, that, that would benefit from my, our software were actually more US based. So although we were headquartered in, in Canada, our ICP, our ideal customer profile was actually North America initially. So one, it's like marketing, you say, who's your ICP? Who are the buyer personas, right? Who buys whatever it is I'm selling? It could be software, it could be services. And so you start to really like profile, your go-to-market is reverse engineered through the lens of the customer, right? And so 
look, if I'm selling um, business to business software, I am not likely to be using TikTok as my channel, right? I'm not likely, um, we're seeing more of it to be using Instagram. I might, yeah. But are your buyers there? I always say when people are like, oh, should we be doing TikTok? Well, are your buyers using TikTok? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or are maybe remarketing just to be there, but uh, to be top of mind, but not necessarily your first choice, right? It's not like mm, you, your your cold traffic comes comes from there. But what uh, what um, challenge I find with ICP, like even with uh, with our clients, and uh, it's like <laughs> this 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 thing that oh, but what if I the, the fear of missing out, right? Like, what if I focus on this ICP and I lose all these other ICPs? Or, and then there is this uh, like fog happening with the ICP, and then GTM is like is a disaster because you market to everybody and to nobody at the end of the day. So, yeah. how do we solve this this challenge when we? We don't know which direction to go to with the ICP, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. it can be for many people yeah, and many yeah. companies. I mean, especially the earlier you are. As an early stage startup, yeah. you're, 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 you, you have a hypothesis, right? Yeah. You, you have a vision, you have an idea, you have a, you, you have a, um, you have a hypothesis of um, I'm building this product, who can buy it? I would actually reverse it. I would say, what are the problems that exist that I know how to solve because I have domain expertise or I have um, experience in, in, in this, in this uh, uh, vertical, like legal, right? That's the domain mm -hmm. expertise. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, I've, and I've worked in law firms um, or I've, I've been on the consulting side uh, where I, 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 I consulted to law firms. And so I, I know this, I, I hear every day, day in and day out that law firms are struggling with X, Y, Z. Okay. So that, that, that become as a, as a, as a founder, are you going to go build a product now for, um, retail stores? Do you, and there's this, always this debate, right? Is domain expertise important? Um, I'll tell the 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 Crossbeam story. Bob Moore, the founder of Crossbeam, his book Ecosystem Led Growth, right? He tells the founder story of mm -hmm. it, it, his software company, which was in the in the um, modern data stack. Um, he built the software company in a closed um, environment, if you will. He he mm -hmm. he. He was thinking that they could own the data stack end to end, that they would solve and provide capability of every piece of, of the data stack that the buyer needed. But what the trend was happening was that actually buyers wanted the best of breed of each piece of the data ah, stack okay. stop software. So he wasn't thinking mm -hmm. APIs, SDKs. He wasn't thinking integration with other products that the the mm -hmm. you know that the buyer was buying he was thinking i'm going to sell the whole kit and caboodle to them but buyers didn't want to buy that way and so mm -hmm. what you know looker one of his competitors they saw it early that they built for ecosystem they built for open they built for the customer and the way the customer wanted to buy and so from a go-to-market perspective, right, Bob knew that partnerships was becoming a really important go-to-market motion because of the way that buyers wanted to buy, right? And so then he built partner tech software and he understood he comes from the data world so he understands the importance of partner data being the foundation of a data-driven partner strategy. And that's that then, then, okay, so I've made the bet 
that any company who has a partner program, that has a partnerships program, that might have a marketplace where they list their products, that's the way that he looks at the ideal customer profile. If they don't, if the company doesn't sell via partners or with partners, then his software isn't needed. So you, you, you start to like really think through the lens and you might have to pivot, which happens a lot in, in companies. You make a hypothesis that you build this software and this buyer needs this software and you're wrong. You're not the best one to solve it. Maybe they need the software, but they, but there's already something better out there. Right. And so, and maybe those people um um video software right maybe they're not comfortable using video in hr so you start to like you have to you have to like really listen to the market and 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 continue to figure out what is the problem we're solving who has that problem and where do we find those people those companies and i, I i'm wondering because you advised very big uh, companies like Workday, Zoom, Gong, HubSpot, just to name a few, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering what were the questions, of the GTM questions or the GTM doubts, let's say, that these companies had uh, back in the day? I suppose they were more early stage when... Um, uh, those conversations happened, or maybe even today. What what are what were those uh, conversations back then, mm -hmm. and what are the conversation yeah. now like, and how did they shift? Yeah, um, here's here's what I've seen happen. Is the I'll, I'll focus on the sales aspect the. When I got into sales at, at Salesforce, SDRs, sales development reps, BDRs, yeah. business development reps, didn't exist. That, that hadn't been a concept that had been created yet. Um, account managers were doing everything, right? I, as, a, as an account executive at Salesforce, yeah. um, I, wasn't, I wasn't drowning in leads generated by by marketing i i wasn't yeah. overwhelmed and drowning in leads i may have been receiving um a lead that was someone who went to a trade show and we scanned the badge right but but that wasn't a qualified ready to buy opportunity yeah. i was a full cycle sales rep so mm -hmm. yes, marketing was generating some, but I also had an account list, right? Based on a geographic territory that I was trying to figure out the data wasn't even that accessible of, um, this is pre LinkedIn. So yeah, websites yeah. were just becoming something that companies were building, right? It, 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 back then it was still your corporate brochure, but you printed the corporate brochure. Right, digital was really just becoming, um, uh, you know, your you, www.shopify.com. Uh, Shopify didn't exist back then, but but that was basically the corporate brochure on a website. On a website, no forms, right? No landing pages, right? So digital, as as marketing had these new digital channels um, and new capabilities to drive people to the website, to see who was there, to create, you know, content that was gated behind a form to get the quote lead because there was interest. So what, what, what started to happen with the BDR SDR function is it was a, as inbound started to be generated, right? Inquiries, instead of having a full cycle salesperson who was, you know, more senior and having that person do the follow-up, right? The call, email, the call, email, the call, email, the hammering of the phones and sending a bunch of emails. And it was manual back then, by the way. There was no automation. There was no like sales loft or outreach or 
and and I've never liked those tools. I've never yeah, like Outlook. <laughs> it, it was Outlook. <laughs> yes. It was literally Outlook, right? There wasn't emails were still not even really trackable back then. Yeah, of course. So so what what we've done is we've we've looked at how can we create a whole lot of volume? And then how do we at the lowest cost possible get 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 people to um uh to try to convert this volume? And we've created all of these handoffs, right? These handoffs okay. from your 22 year old kid with no knowledge, no network, no business acumen, this 22 year old kid trying to get the attention of this buyer. And to me, all of the things that we've been doing to automate, um, uh, is, 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 is what we want to do as a company. Like we think we control the buyer's journey. We think we can, we, we call it the sales process, not what is the buyer's journey, right? So we, we are shoving buyers down our sales process rather than looking at what does the buyer really value, right? How would they like to be engaged, right? And then, and then, and then doing those things. Nobody wants the call, email, call, email, LinkedIn play that now you have, you know, every software company at least has an army and, and we're, we're correcting. There's a correction happening. There's a correction happening of wait. Yeah. Last year it started to, with the tech layoffs, right? Yes. Yeah, and because realizing. we are transitioning from, I think, growth at all costs yes. to more efficiency, more revenue, rather, at all costs, right? Yes, and exactly. What was top of mind in GTM teams in 2018 and versus now? Yeah. Um, okay. So it, 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 it's, it's hard to talk holistically about GTM <laughs> in, 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 you know, in a because it's so uh, interconnected and interdependent is is what I would say. And what what we what we what we saw in 2018 is each function was still optimizing for what was happening within their function, right? So, mm -hmm. so siloed was type of siloed, okay. right? And it was. Look, this is not easy. I'm not like me talking about it. I make it sound easy and so yeah. obvious, but this is really, really, really hard. And as a company gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and has multiple products, multiple geographies, they're serving SMB mid market enterprise, they have a product led growth strategy, they combine that with we're product led, and now we add salespeople to the motion. Enterprise. Like, look, this is this is not easy to even get uh, 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 alignment, if you will, in one function, right? Where marketing yeah. brand, let's just talk, take brand and demand, where brand and demand are working in partnership, where they're where they're looking at how is brand impacting demand. Right. And then also like our customers, what's the impact that our customers are having on our brand? What's the impact that our partners are having on our brand? And so look, it's hard to even get the orchestration um, and, 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 and what is the metric that we're measured on and how does each piece of this actually impact the metric? It's very, it's, it's this is challenging. But what has to happen because we need to understand when we launch a new product and we come up with this messaging and this positioning and we sell it a certain way and we win the customer, 
are we actually solving the problem that we've told the customer that we can solve? Does that make sense? So Lauren Vaccarello, I've, I've learned so much from her, but she had always been in, in the marketing function and, and started on the digital SEO side. And she ended up like she, she then at Box, she was on the, on the CS side, on the customer success service. And because she's a marketer, what she understood is that they were acquiring these customers that, 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 that they had a different expectation of what the product could do. So they had to go back and say, we have to, we have to position this differently or change the product to solve the problem that our buyers think that. So these are, the, the, the point is that they're interdependent, right? If we keep functional silos, then sales is really optimizing for, for, for you know, new logo. And so you're closing bad fit deals potentially because you're just trying to close new logos. You don't care downstream as an AE who's only measured and compensated on new revenue. You're not worried about is that customer going to churn, which creates a systemic problem because your best salespeople are not on your payroll. Your best salespeople are your customers, your customers who love you, who recommend you, who talk about you on podcasts and do presentations at events and reference you. Those are the most because it comes down to trust. Who do buyers trust? Not your interruptive cold calls, SDRs with no knowledge network or business acumen. Right, the information already exists. I don't need, I don't need an SDR to give me product data sheets, right? So it, it really is, and it's always been that word of mouth is your no cost lead, but it isn't really no cost. It's a, it, it is, it is, it is. It's branding, it's product, it's, uh, yeah. Customer exactly. experience. Consider experience exactly, experience. and I'm curious. Like, um, if you have if you have different um, products for different use cases and different size of businesses, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I know it's getting complicated. Um, will you do different positioning for each one of them, or how can you do positioning like? Uh, as an umbrella uh, or as holistically to, to cover all because there are different use cases. Yes, there are different use cases. Um, if you look at, uh, I like use case the best rather than mm. feature function. I think what is the use case tailored to how my business is going to actually use this. Yeah, because it's outcome. I mean, how, who cares about the future? I mean, I don't care that it's, I don't know, does magic pink uh, dashboards, like, will I use those magic pink dashboards? Not really. What is the question that- <laughs> Or maybe. Well, what is the question that I need to ask, right? Exactly, yeah. So help me understand, what are the questions that your existing customers are asking that they're getting the answers to. So what are those? And, and tell me about that use case. Show me that, right? Show me, okay, there, here's a use case. There's a problem I need to solve. I was just listening to a podcast um, with a, a partner ops professional. Her name's Wendy Wen. She's at Pigment. Um, she's only, she's relatively new to the partnership function. She was in consulting. And, and, and she was in consulting for a good chunk of her career. She realized, like I did, I was in consulting for six years right out of college. She realized she didn't want to be a partner at this consulting company. So she went looking mm -hmm. for what does she want to do next? Very similar to my journey back in 2000 when I was getting out of consulting and looking for what did I want to do next? Um, she is in partner ops at Pigment mm -hmm. and she is using 
ClickUp. I hear her on the podcast talk about how she's using ClickUp instead of buying a partner relationship management product for deal registration so her partners can register deals. Instead of buying a new piece of software, she's looking at what is the existing software that they already have in the organization. They're using mm -hmm. ClickUp in marketing. So what is the software that they have that she can actually do the job that she's trying to do rather than go out and buy a new piece of software? So I'm like, mm, could this be a new use case for ClickUp okay. to market? Hmm. Is ClickUp even using ClickUp? Aware, yeah. So what I do is I go to LinkedIn and I look at ClickUp and I say, do I know anybody mm -hmm. at ClickUp? I really want to know if I know anybody at partnerships at ClickUp. Mm -hmm. And so then I see that they're like director level partner guy um, he posted on LinkedIn talking about their partner program. And so I comment on the part, on that post, hey, listen to this podcast with Wendy. She mentions how she's using ClickUp to do X, Y, Z. This mm -hmm. could be a new use case that they, and a new buyer, right? She's not in marketing. She's in partner ops. So you start to see, wow, are any of our other customers like Wendy, right? Mm -hmm. In partnerships, trying to figure out. So, so should ClickUp now and this guy or girl from ClickUp do a new messaging positioning for that campaign and for, for that use case? Potentially. What should ClickUp person yeah. <laughs> do in this yeah. situation? The head of partnerships at ClickUp, the first thing that the head of partnerships at ClickUp should do is, is connect with Wendy. Because Wendy at Pigment, right? She's a customer. They're, Pigment okay. is a customer of ClickUp. You should be talking to customers all the freaking time. Everybody in your organization should be talking to customers and not just listening to the gong calls, but having conversations with customers. Okay, listening to podcasts of your customers talking, like the calls that you're recording within your organization with your customers is one source, but how about you go listen to a podcast, a webinar of this customer being interviewed and, and you start to hear like what the customer is motivated by, what they think about, what they care about. You might learn that they have a cute little multi-poo like I do. And I could send a picture of Toby, right? My doll. I'm starting to actually um, know they buyer. So so I know this is long-winded, but but this isn't what I'm- yeah, I, I, I get the point. But if you are convinced and you say, okay, I talk to the customer, voila, we come up with a new use case. Yes. Partnerships yeah. ops with ClickUp. Yes. Right? Yes. So should I make, I want to go to market with this use case, right? Find more people like uh, Wendy. Yes. So yes. should I do then the position in the messaging, everything around it just because it's a new use case for this? Or how should I tackle this? You're going to tackle it first from a data lens. Right. So just mm -hmm. because you have one customer using your product, she's a new buyer persona. She's in a new function. You don't sell to the partnership mm -hmm. function today. So now you're going to have to say, wow, do we have the bandwidth to create this offering, this packaging, this messaging, this um, uh, uh, use case, like the demo environment? Do we have CSM? Like, do we have customer success managers who would actually be able to support that use case? Do we have like, so you, you really have to say as an organization, and is it, is this the best use of our, our limited Time. resources? Yeah. Right. Is this, it's the trade-off. If I pursue yeah. this, what can't I do? Right. What can't I do? Um, the opportunity cost. Yo, I'm a businesswoman. 
I studied business yeah, yeah, yeah. at UVA. That's how I think about things is through the lens of, does, is this a is this a, a good commercial decision? Right. Or will it make money at the end of the day? Will right. it make money? Will it make money? <laughs> right? Show me the money. Will <laughs> this make money? And and, and I think exactly. you have to ask: Is it sustainable revenue? Right. And so what we see in all of the research that I've been consuming about the partner motion is that, and if you if you go and I was. I was watching some videos from Workdays, um, last year's Workday Rising. I've watched the 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 investor presentation um, of the Workday exec team. You know, talking to their investors about what their corporate strategy is. They are on record. They know that partnerships is a more durable and sustainable a revenue source for them. Because they know that if Workday is more tightly integrated with all the other stuff that their buyers are already using, you know, the, the, the stat is if, if your product is integrated with 10 other products that your buyer is using, your product is embedded into 10 other products that your buyer is using, they're not, it, it's a whole lot less likely that they're going to churn. They're not going to rip you out, your product out, because now, from a data and a process and a workflow and, and actually your people, like now all of that has to change. And so it's okay, no, um, it works well enough. It's too deeply ingrained and embedded into what we're already doing today. And so the, the, the deci like decisions cannot be made lightly. You have to analyze the data. What is the market opportunity? What is our ability to execute against that, to capture that market opportunity? Jill, I know that uh, we are getting to the, our mark and we can talk about this a lot, but as a last question before we close, where we can learn more about you, read about you, which, which podcast episodes you had you would recommend for uh, the listeners so that they can dive even more deeper than this initial introduction to Jill Rovley. Yeah, it 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 is so um because I'm old. I'm 51 yeah. and I do have 24 years of experience in B2B SaaS and I have been interviewed on tons of podcasts. I've done lots of webinars. Um, I, 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 I've been a keynote speaker globally. So I have, and I have content, I have a lot of content out there, books that I've contributed to, been referenced in. It's a shit ton of content, right? And how do you filter <laughs> all of that? It, it really is, I think, topic specific. And what are you, what are you interested in learning more about? Uh, I, 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 I came across a, a video from Inbound 2016, HubSpot's Inbound 2016. I just recently came across it. I watched it and it, 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 it there's now looking at it, it it's history, right? It, it, it's history of what was relevant in Yeah, in the Senate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things um, uh, I did, I was more focused on sales and marketing and how do you... How do you get on the same page, right? How do you how do you row in the same direction? Uh, but I talked a lot about social selling and content as the currency of the modern sales professional and how marketing and sales could work together in that regard. I mentioned that the best salespeople take an ecosystem approach. That was in 2016, so referencing ecosystem approach, right? And at the end of that video, I talked about AI. And how AI oh, wow. was coming for us. So we will check that out. We will check that out. So that's about <laughs> more social selling. There's thanks a lot, Jill. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. This is our hour mark. Jill Rovley, it's it was an honor to have you. 23 years experience in GTM, bunch of, of nuggets here. And I will put in the, the show notes all the links so that you can follow Jill. Awesome. Thank you.
Romeo Mon, thank you so much for having me on. I really thank appreciate you. it. Take care. Enjoy the, the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.